Hello, my name's Mark Littlewood. I'm the Director General at the Institute of Economic Affairs. The following video is one of a series of webinars conceived and hosted by the IEA to help better understand and debate many of the issues raised by the coronavirus pandemic right across Europe. In this film, we'll hear from leading think tank experts from across the continent who will be explaining their own country's response to COVID-19 and we'll be debating the merits and policies and approaches being deployed. I hope you enjoy the discussion. So let me introduce our, um, our panelists. Uh, our first panelist is Martin Aguero. He is the president of SIPOS, the leading free market think tank in Denmark. Martin is also the author of numerous well-known books on topics ranging from economic inequality to innovation. And uh, they always have, I'm pleased to say, a rather optimistic outlook on the future. We're looking for Martin's optimistic uh, twist to what has been very trying times across the globe. Our second panelist is Jakob Lundberg uh, from the IA sister organization in Sweden, Timbro's chief economist. Uh, he will be joining us, and prior to his current role at Timbro, he's been a researcher at a number of Swedish think tanks, including Ratio and the Reform Institute. And uh, last but by no means least, we have Juan Angel Santo. Um, who's the director of Civissimo, Epicenter's Spanish member think tank. His background is in academia. Prior to taking on the leadership role of Civissimo, he was a researcher of development economics at the Novara Center for International Development and a public policy researcher at St. Mary's University in London. Uh, welcome to all of our panelists. I'm sure you're receiving a rapturous virtual round of applause from all of our um, uh, guests and attendees. Uh, the floor is yours, Martin, if you're five minutes start now, then I'll move on to Jakob and then Juan. Martin, thank you for joining us. Good evening. Thank you for having me. Well, the, um, we've had a, a lockdown in Denmark since um, uh, March 11, uh, or formally since March 13. Uh, and um, but it, but it's a milder lockdown than what you see in many countries. Not as mild as Sweden. I assume we'll get to that, Jakob. Uh, but milder than in many countries. And I think one way to think about this is that um, there are different tools you can use to lock down. Of course, maybe we should be talking about strategy at some point as well. But let's start with you know what's actually going on. Um, so lockdown is, is one measure. Uh, another measure is social distancing. Uh, they are related, obviously. People will be more, more practicing more social distancing if, if, um, if they are um, not allowed to, um, to, to uh, uh, attend to their job, for instance, uh, or use public transport. Um, but um, in many ways, social distancing can be voluntary. I mean, people can decide that they want to, to do their part, or maybe they're just afraid that they will get, uh, get the disease and decide to practice social distancing. And as it turns out, I think one way to think about this is that uh, if you have uh, high trust countries like the Scandinavian, uh, j just having politicians or authorities, uh, or even doctors saying, this is what you should do, can actually be very, very effective. Uh, and um, the voluntary social distancing has been very effective in Denmark. It's probably been more important than the lockdown. Uh, and it started before the lockdown. You can see on uh, data from uh, Google searches, for instance, that searches for restaurants stopped um, a few weeks before the lockdown or, or went down considerably a few weeks before the lockdown. So that's an indication that people all, already started practicing social distancing. Um, and the lockdown in Denmark is, uh, you know, in a international comparison, relatively mild. I think there's still reason to criticize parts of it and, and certainly parts of the policy the government has been uh, um, putting forward. Um, but it's a lockdown where, for instance, I went to Copenhagen today, I had a meeting. Uh, um, a lot of businesses are working. Uh, schools have been shut down for a while, they're reopening. Um, uh, so, and um, cafes are shot, um, cinemas are shot, um, libraries and stuff like that. A lot of people in the public sector, the non-essential part of the public sector, a term I like, <laughs> I find a lot of perspective in that. 
um, were, were, were sent home and working from home. But a lot of the stuff that's been going on has been voluntary. So for instance, if you take my, my think tank, um, half an hour after the prime minister finished a speech on television, I locked down CFOS. Not because I had to, but because I thought, you know, okay, the prime minister says this, so I'll, I'm going to do that. And obviously I also did it because we, <laughs> we're a think tank. We can still, we're 110% productive uh, working from home. Um, but many businesses did that. And a lot of people, a lot of old people self-isolated before the lockdown because they realized that they were uh, uh, in, in a vulnerable group and, uh, and uh, wanted to do that. So we've had a situation where um, um, the analysis shows that the voluntary part of the lockdown has actually been the most effective. The problem is how long can we continue that? How long will Danes be willing to continue that? And part of what the government has done is that they have presented this at the beginning as if it was a sprint and people are starting to realize that it's a marathon. Uh, so I'm not sure that we have a, um, that we have a sustainable uh, strategy. We certainly don't have a long-term strategy yet in Denmark. Um, uh, and um, actually, and you know, I can't believe I'm saying this because there are arch rivals, but I'm rooting for Sweden. <laughs> uh, <laughs> is that good enough for a start, Mark? That's very useful, yes. Thank you very much. I'm going to come back on some of the points that you've raised. Crucially, this, this issue, which uh, I think is very important for free market liberals about could much, uh, much of the benefit, many of the benefits, perhaps all of the benefits have been achieved voluntarily. Do you actually need state enforcement to uh, achieve it? Is it the state's business? Um, yeah. Can, can we, I just add one thing then? Yeah. That doesn't mean that it's not costly. Uh, the, the, uh, even though it's voluntary, it's still going to be costly, but maybe costly in a different way and maybe less costly. Sure. So maybe we can get to that. Sure. Uh, thank you very much for your opening remarks, uh, Martin. Again, I'll remind all of our guests, type in your questions in the Q&A on any aspect of coronavirus across uh, Europe that you'd like to ask about, and we'll come to that when all of our panelists have concluded their opening remarks. Uh, let me now go over to Sweden, I think described as the last liberal country on earth, uh, so it's very good to uh, have you uh, linked up to us. Uh, Jakob, the floor is yours and your five minutes start now. Good evening, thank you for joining us. Uh, thanks Mark, yeah, who would have thought Sweden to be the, the last liberal country, but yeah, as, as Martin touched upon, Sweden has taken a much more less affair approach compared to, to many other countries. So. Concretely, the measures that have been taken is that crowds of more than 50 people are not allowed, and you have to have table service at bars and restaurants uh, and high schools and universities are closed. Uh, but that's pretty much it. Apart from that, the government is relying on recommendations. So uh, people are recommended to work from home if they can, uh, to avoid public transport and large social gatherings. And, uh, and also that, of course, elderly and, and people at risk should, should isolate themselves and, and not meet other people. Uh, and, and as Martin said, I think in perhaps more in Scandinavia than in other countries, people are following these recommendations. So it was the same with, with Timbro uh, within yeah, probably half an hour of, in this case, the, the Public Health Agency of Sweden recommending everyone to, to work from home and uh, unless they, they, they had to be at work. Uh, we, we closed down the, the think tank. So now we have been working from, from home for, for about a month now. Uh, and and uh, I think it's an interesting question why Sweden has taken such a different route compared to, to other countries. Uh, Sweden has a culture of, of operational independence for public authorities. So the uh, politicians set the, the framework, but then it's the experts at the, these public authorities uh, uh, that, that uh, decide on, on the details. Uh, and the, the politicians have been following the advice of the, the public health agency of Sweden and the, the state epidemiologist who is the, the main official at, at that agency. Um, and I don't think that Sweden has been following uh, a herd immunity strategy as, as has been suggested in, in the British press, for example. Uh, I think that the officials, they, they don't think that more far reaching measures are, would be effective or needed at this time. Uh, so they're saying that uh, right now it seems that the, the measures that have been taken are sufficient and people are following the recommendations to, to uh, uh, a pretty good extent, uh, but they haven't ruled out introducing more restrictive measures 
if you see that people aren't following the recommendations or if we see that, uh, that the virus is going to spread more. Now it looks like the, 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 the epidemic has reached a plateau in Sweden, if you look at the last week or so. Um, but um, everyone's obviously following the situation closely. Uh, so, and I'm not sure if this is the right strategy, uh, as, as Martin said, I, I wish it were, uh, but we, we can't be sure until afterwards uh, when we'll be able to, to evaluate this. Uh, so it might be the case uh, that people will say afterwards uh, that Sweden should have taken more restrictive measures earlier, uh, or it will be clear that, that it, it wouldn't be necessary, uh, the measures that other European countries have taken, that uh, they were too far reaching. Uh, and I think in some cases, you see that there's, it, it makes a difference that politicians are, are making these decisions. Uh, I, I think that in some countries you see a tendency of politicians overreacting because they want to send a signal, they want to seem like they're making the bold decisions. Uh, uh, so um, I don't really see the point of banning people from mm, walking outside alone uh, more than once a day or whatever the rule is or or driving alone in their car uh, it just seemed like signal signaling rather than actually effective policies um, so uh, I think that could be one explanation um, uh, yeah so so we'll, we'll see how how this, well, how this is going to turn out uh, if, if Sweden will have to uh, to take more drastic measures. For example, closing the schools is something that uh, has been discussed, but uh, a big argument against that is what you're going to do with the healthcare personnel and, and, and their children if they're going to have to stay at home. Uh, and uh, I think there's public support for the Swedish strategy. Uh, I saw an opinion poll that said that something like 70% of people uh, oppose closing the schools. Um, so at least uh, when it comes to that, it seems that people are, are supporting uh, politicians and, and the, the public health officials. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Jakob, for sticking to time. Uh, let me uh, now go over to what I think we'll discover is rather less liberal Spain uh, and uh, ask Juan for his opening statement. Juan, thank you very much for joining us. The floor is yours for five minutes. Well, thank you uh, for the invitation to participate as panelists in this webinar. Definitely uh, less liberal uh, Spain. If Sweden is the alpha, Spain is now the omega here. Just to take a look at some figures. So we have over 22,000 people killed by COVID-19 in Spain, which is about a fraction of the real figures, which amount to about 50,000 people uh, because the government is doing everything it can to hide the real numbers as they show how well, terribly wrong we are dealing with this crisis. We've been uh, not in voluntary but mandatory lockdown since March 14th. Since then, we've had also two weeks where only essential uh, economic activities were allowed to carry on. Hotels, pubs, restaurants are closed. Uh, the academic year for kindergarten, school, universities uh, is over, uh, which makes for all of us who have children uh, working from home a bit more challenging, as you all know. Um, the perspectives, according to the uh, International Monetary Fund, are not so good as our GDP will fall by 8%. Uh, plus, according to the Bank of Spain uh, latest report, uh, the fall will be really of double digits, about 13%. Uh, because of this lockdown and the uh, policies the government is implementing, um, particularly um, important is uh, international tourism, which in the case of Spain amounts to over 13% of our GDP and about 14% of all jobs are created thanks to uh, tourism and that's only direct jobs. Um, so this is a, a disaster really, both in the economic and health spheres, uh, but also, and I think we can discuss that later on, um, there is a, a growing tendency towards uh, authoritarianism that goes far beyond the extraordinary powers. We now have in Spain a coalition government of socialists and communists, which is attacking uh, and making the most, taking advantage of, of this uh, crisis really. Um, 
And hence, I don't see such a bright future ahead for Spain if we continue our current path. Okay, thank you for your thoughts. I was going to kick off with a couple of observations of my own and then ask the panelists a couple of questions. We've got a dozen or so piled up already. Uh, I was very interested to hear from my Scandinavian colleagues about, you know, the Prime Minister said it might be a good idea to close down your offices, and you duly did. I had exactly the opposite <laughs> reaction in London. I mean, we were the last people standing in Westminster. It was extraordinary. Um, and by the time we finally closed the office, we did give people the option to work from home if they wished to uh, take that option. But I can remember it will, it will remain in my memory for a very long time, the final day that our office was open. And the few of us who were there went down the pub afterwards. It was a Thursday evening. And going down the pub was social distancing. We were the only people in it. Um, the rest <laughs> of Westminster were up there. But I was going to ask each of you, uh, I've got three quick questions um, on, uh, from my perspective, which I think are important ones for people interested in economics uh, and from a free market liberal perspective. The first question I want to ask each of you, and I'll take you in the turn in which you spoke, is the question of trade-offs. Uh, this sounds brutal and inhumane, but if we're economists, uh, what sort of price do we put on a human life? It's all very well to say, well, we'll see what happens. But if you're causing two billion pounds worth of damage to the economy every day, how many lives do you expect that to save? Is it worth it if it saves one life? Does it need to save a thousand, ten thousand, or whatever? How, how should, I mean, I know it's a, an uncomfortable topic, but how should people with an economic way of thinking make those? Uh, my second question is about. Um, who do we actually think is taking the risk? So if you don't socially distance and you are going around hugging and kissing people and shaking hands and all of the rest of it, uh, I mean, a lot, assuming you're doing that with the consent of the people you're shaking hands with and hugging and kissing, I mean, aren't you the ones bearing the risk? So sort of, does it matter? I mean, isn't it just like, you know, whether you choose to eat a healthy diet or an unhealthy diet? Why do we need to, aren't we just protecting people from themselves? Uh, the, I mean, the only sort of twist there, I guess, is the capacity of the healthcare system. That's been the big issue in Britain, where we have a largely nationalised healthcare system that concerns of incapacity. If you get sick, you're, you're, you're sort of taking up a bed and space at a time when there's very high levels of demand. And my final question, do you think as, uh, if, if we are generally, I mean, no different parts of Europe or different parts of the curve, but uh, as the infection rate and the death rate falls, do you think public sympathy for the lockdown will begin to wither? Uh, I mean, my observation in the United Kingdom is people have been, by and large, extremely compliant. But that's been because until now, we've seen the number of people dying going up every day. Uh, if, which seems to be happening now, that starts going down every day, I'm wondering whether people will be so compliant if the number of people dying every day falls, you know, to 100 or 50 or a dozen, whether they would then consider the uh, the lockdown measures to be disproportionate to trade-offs, whether it's a self-regarding risk, and where you think public sort of attitude and sympathies might go if we're beginning to get down to the other side of the curve. Martin, I'll start with you. Yeah, okay. Um, trade-offs, um, I agree. It's uh, an issue that needs to be discussed. In Denmark, the whole thing was uh, started, I think one of the differences between Denmark and Sweden, maybe the main difference is what Jakob was alluding to, saying that in Sweden, it's the authorities, that it's the experts, so to speak, the health uh, authorities that have been <clears throat> calling the game and also been sort of presenting uh, the, the issues the way I see it. In Denmark has been the prime minister. <clears throat> Sorry. <coughs> and she has... Um, um, from the start, taken a very ideological position. She's a social democrat, and uh, basically said the welfare state. Uh, th this is this is a moment where the welfare state needs to prove its worth. So all the strong need to protect all the weak, and the strong are the ones who are not old or you know uh, have the conditions that make them susceptible to to a, a severe. Um, um, case of, this, of, of corona uh, and we need to do whatever we can uh, to prevent uh, all the deaths possible basically that's what she said in the beginning and to a lot of people that sounds very reasonable uh, for a start and it was very very difficult in the beginning to have this debate uh, but of course in a healthcare system 
they have it every day. There are there are uh, medical procedures that are uh, that exist uh, that are proven, uh, but which are not provided within the Danish healthcare system because they are too expensive compared to the benefits that we get out of it in terms of saved saved lives, for instance. Uh, there are uh, you, protective measures in, in traffic, for instance, uh, lowering uh, speed limits or putting up more signs or traffic uh, uh, signals or whatever that are not uh, investments that are not undertaken because it, uh, it's, uh, th th they're not saving enough lives. So, so, so this, is, this is a thing that's going on. It's debate that, that's going on sort of beneath the surface, surface all the time, but normally politicians um, oh, sort of um, protect themselves from getting too much involved in that by letting the experts like the doctors decide what is the right thing to do from a health perspective or economists for that matter. In this case, suddenly the politicians are uh, standing in front of the, uh, the voters and they find it very, very hard to discuss this. And that's a, that's a big issue because the lockdown is very, very expensive. And we've made a, a calculation. We've looked at the costs and benefits. You know, How much does it cost to save one life? And obviously it's based on estimates and assumptions and all that. But, but our estimate shows that it's about five times as expensive as what we'd normally want to, to be spending uh, to save a, uh, one extra life a year. And that's a, a very conservative estimate. More, a more realistic estimate says it's 20 times more expensive. Um, so um, putting out estimates like that, we were among the first who did it, uh, was very, very um, <laughs> tra traumatizing. Um, uh, people uh, did not like to hear that. But you know, if you can save 20 times as many lives using the same money in a different way, then maybe um, the bad people are, are not the ones putting that statement forward, but, but the ones making the decision to go along anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so the other uh, question is more uh, principle, a uh, question of principle is, 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 um, is this disease just, you know, if you run a risk of, of, of catching it, isn't it just your, your own problem? I, I think it's not. And I think it's part of the uh, classical liberal literature uh, to look at epidemics as an example of some uh, of something where there, there is a market failure because you, you by catching the disease, you also risk infecting other people. Uh, so that's an externality. Um, and I think especially with this disease, there's a point there because young people are not at risk. Uh, I mean, very, very low risk for complications. Whereas the older you get, the, the larger are the complications. So you could argue that a lot of young people would have risky behavior that is uh, of a very low cost to themselves, but they could impose a high cost on other people uh, by having that risky behavior. So I would argue that there's a market failure here and there's room, that there could be room for, 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 for policy. Now, of course, the problem is that, that there's also a risk of government failure, of policy failure, of politicians making very bad decisions about what's the right thing to do. And I, I believe that you should use voluntary measures as much as possible. I think norms are very important. And there's also the long-term aspect of this. You know, how long can a, a lockdown ca go on? And, and what's the end game here? Do we expect to reach a stage where we have fewer people who actually get the infection, um, but we get the vaccine beforehand? That's a year or 18 months out into the future. Will people accept the lockdown or voluntary social distancing for, for that amount of time. I doubt that. And in fact, you're already seeing people in Denmark realizing that it's not a sprint, but a marathon. And uh, a lot of people are very shocked about that um, and saying, well, we can't go on like this. So, um, so we really need to discuss the long term uh, on this issue. Uh, public attitudes, well, I'm moving into that now. I think, uh, I think the main shift uh, is probably Two things, I think, are, two or three things are important. I think the first thing that happened was that if this had ha started in, in uh, Britain or Denmark or Sweden, I think maybe we would have made very different decisions. It started in, in Europe, at least, in Italy. And um, something went terribly wrong in Italy. And we don't know exactly what it was, 
but we can see that affection rates uh, or death rates rather uh, among Italian Swiss are much higher than death rates among German Swiss. So there's some indication here that what's going on is not at, at the nature of the disease, but maybe the nature of uh, cultural things, social interaction, uh, young and old people living together, whatever it is, it is that's been going on in Italy, including the fact that they were the first, they didn't know what they were dealing with, and they, they put sick people into intensive care, and they infected all the others and all that. So there's, but in, in, Scand in Denmark, at least, the story became that um, we want to avoid Italian uh, conditions like in Italy. And that's obvious. Everybody does that. The question is, you know, couldn't we have done that in a different way? And that's not a strategy. Not wanting to be like Italy, that's not a strategy. But we need to think a little bit more about what do we actually want to be? And in some ways, I want to be more like Sweden right now. I think Sweden is, is mm -hmm. onto something. Uh, you know, and, and maybe South Korea is, is onto something about uh, testing and, and, and tracing, etc. So, so the public opinion needs to realize that um, the, the, the sort of bogeyman of, of Italy, that's not a strategy. And we need to think more intelligently about how we want to deal with this. I just want to come back to your one point, Martin, before I go to Yakov about whether this is a market failure. Because, I mean, I appreciate that you're, you're de dealing with a kind of social market model entirely for the sake of argument, a pub down the road opened and said, well, you know, you can come here entirely at your own risk. I mean, we make no judgment at all about whether the people coming in are infected or not infected. Um, if you come along, you know, you are obviously increasing your risk of contracting coronavirus. And they will be consenting adults in the pub. Um, I mean, it's other regarding in the sense that you can uh, infect people, but it's a private property decision. Right? That you can you can choose not. We're not forcing anyone to go down the pub. We're allowing people to go down the pub, and maybe all of the people who go down the pub then get infected and sick, and then you've got to ask questions about who's paying for their health care. Of course, that might be the market failure. But couldn't you? Doesn't private property enable us to make sure the risk isn't a market failure? You can make it a choice. Um, people take all sorts of collective risks all the time. You know, you get on an aeroplane. If you've been on the aeroplane taking a collective risk, it might fall out of the sky. Um, what, why is this really different? Could you not allow people to stop isolation and, you know, on, on their head be it? Well, um, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure I'm buying your metaphor here. I, I think it's two different situations. Um, um, getting on a flight is, is, is not like... Um, uh, infecting uh, someone else with the disease. I, I think, I, 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 would you be opposed to, um, um, well, you probably would be, but it's quite, I would argue that um, uh, there is a case for um, mandatory uh, vaccines, for instance. You know, if, if, if polio is a serious disease and uh, some people decide that they don't want a, a polio vaccine and a large enough group of people decide that, that's going to, to put me and my children at risk. Mm. Um, yeah. um, it's a public good issue, really, at that point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. And you could argue, well, you could just have your ch children uh, vaccine, uh, but... but, but um, uh, well, you know, immunity is clearly a public good, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So I, 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 th I think it is. A, I think it is a public good. But I, I agree that that we need to think in a much more sort of free market. Uh, uh, we, we need to think a lot more like economists about how to deal with this. We can use voluntary measures and in, 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 and incentives in many ways. You know, I wouldn't. The, the, the way to think about this is we don't need to get to a situation where nobody is uh, ever infected by someone else uh, from, from a sort of uh, uh, public policy point of view. Uh, that's, we, we need to avoid overwhelming the, the healthcare system. So you can have a, a situation where you, you pay people if they engage in a certain behavior to get to a level where enough people behave in that way. That's better than compulsion, I think. Uh, Jakob, your thoughts on the, the you know, an economic approach to this with regard to trade-offs, risks, and any views on 
on public sympathy, um, uh, either in Sweden or elsewhere, and whether actually uh, people thought they were in for a sprint and might have a sense of humor failure when they discover it's a marathon. I'll start with the second question. I think that's a very interesting discussion. And I agree with, with Martin here. Uh, and I think you could see this if, if I if I potentially carry the virus and I risk infecting you by coughing on you, that would infringe your rights. So that would, in, in some sense, legitimize putting some restrictions on me. I mean, it's not entirely clear, at least if you know that I'm infected and potentially also if you know that I might be infected. Uh, but definitely not if you if you know that I'm not infected. Uh, so, but if there's a risk, I, I think you, you could say that you, you risk um, infringing someone else's rights, especially if you are on public on public places, public streets, etc. Then I think there's definitely a case for for the landowner in that case, the government to to set some restrictions or rules for for how people interact. Um, so I, I agree with how, how Martin's viewing this. Uh, and your first question about trade-offs, I think also is, is very interesting. I, I, I did some, some quick calculations for, for Sweden about that. Uh, and under some assumptions, for example, that half of the population is infected and some, some assumptions about mortality, uh, uh, I concluded that Sweden would lose approximately 500,000 life years due to the corona epidemic. Uh, and using the, the conventional uh, value of, of a life year estimates that are used in, in other cases that, that Martin was talking about, uh, the value on that would be a, about 30 billion euros. Uh, so that, that would mean that the, the government should potentially spend quite a lot of money to, to uh, and, and uh, restrict economic activity to a, a very large extent in order to, to um, reduce the, uh, the impact of this epidemic on public health. Uh, but the, there is a ceiling. There, there comes, a, there is a limit when it, it's not worth it anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. And these are obviously very tough trade-offs. But I think that's a discussion that that we should have, and that we're not having at the moment. Not in Sweden or any other country that that I've seen. A few economists have have been talking about this. Uh, we're, we're used to having these uh, these tough discussions. But uh, I think a lot of politicians they don't want, really want to see. The trade-off, um, and obviously, it's, it's, I think both the public health and the economic impact is is, is unavoidable in both cases. A lot of it, at, at least, um, that that you, um, I mean, a, a lot of people are, are unfortunately going to to pass away anyway, uh, and a lot of the economic effects are are also unavoidable. I would say especially in small economies like, like Sweden and Denmark, where a lot of this is coming from abroad and coming from, from voluntary measures that, that people are taking. Could I just ask you your views on public sympathy? You've said that the, the Swedes have been broadly supportive of the fairly liberal regime that Sweden's done. I mean, what's your, do you think that it's likely that people, so I mean, there isn't, you know, I mean, there is a bit to unwind in Sweden, but do you think it's likely that people's compliance will start to diminish as the um, mortality, you know, as the number of deaths falls, basically, that people can see that it's worth doing all of this as things are getting worse and worse, more and more people are dying. But when we're on the other side of the curve, if uh, fingers crossed we are, then people will start to say, well, hang on, why am I being prevented in to go, you know, from going out or going to the shops or whatever? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> we're already seeing indications of that in Sweden. And it, it hasn't even started declining. It's just a plateau, as it seems, or a, a, a very small increase, perhaps. But, but people are, are it, there are some indications that people are getting tired of, of, of sitting at home all day. Uh, so there are some, some uh, articles in the press about how, how bars and restaurants are full of people again, especially when the weather is nice, so people want to sit outside and, and have a beer. And, uh, so I think there are indications of that already happening, uh, and that has also uh, increased the risk of, of more restrictive measures being implemented. Okay. Well, well, let me bring you in, because I'm conscious time's ticking. We've got about 25 questions in the, in the question box. I'll try and get through <laughs> as many lines as possible. Well, let me uh, hear your thoughts on trade-offs, whether the risks are self-regarding or over-regarding, and, and where you think public sympathy might change as the... Uh, data changes with regard to the infection rate and the death rate. Okay, um, when it comes to um, 
the self regarding cyber things, I, I would agree with uh, Martin and Jacob um, in the issue of this, uh, of being infected as, as an externality and the government uh, having to intervene. Uh, as, and regarding your, your take, uh, Martin, uh, Mark, sorry, um, of this being a, a choice, I would argue that this, this, all, uh, th this also has some uh, component of uh, timing because, uh, well, this could be a choice until being infected is no longer a choice. Meaning uh, if there are so many infected people in society or the risk is so high that you cannot do anything about it, so there is no choice anymore or the choice is, is not as, uh, as clear as uh, in other countries. And that would be the case of Spain uh, as opposed to that of uh, Sweden, for instance. Uh, when it comes to trade-offs, unfortunately, and this is something you have to work on uh, because it's uh, very interesting, we don't have any estimates uh, in Civismo um, on how much is alive for. Um, contrary to, to Sweden, and perhaps more uh, uh, in line with uh, that of uh, Denmark, our prime minister is doing things, is reacting, really uh with no um you know experts or uh scientists behind him and again just like in in denmark but with uh far worse uh, results obviously uh the strong are protecting the weak or that's the idea meaning that employers are not are not allowed, being allowed to to fire people unless uh the businesses are are killed as well uh, the private healthcare is being intervened, um, prices are being set. So, um, but again, we, we don't have that, uh, that figure of, of how much is a life worth. Um, finally, uh, when it comes to attitudes, obviously as, as the number of people dying goes down and the money uh, remaining in our bank accounts uh, goes down as well, uh, compliance goes down. So, and this is also uh, fueled by, by well, uh, as I mentioned earlier, constant lies uh, from government officials, from the police saying uh, in, in press conferences that they are aiming to kind of minimize attitudes contrary to, to uh, the way the government is dealing with the crisis, uh, with the fact that the Ministry of Health um, has has conceded that they don't really know the the real figures, etc. So uh, we are getting tired of this situation. Sure. Okay. Let me bring in uh, a number of uh, questions. I'm going to try and rattle through these as much as I can, and I'm probably going to throw, let's say, three or four of the, the, all of you panelists and ask you to pick out probably the the one or the two that you're most interested in, and keep your answers very short, so I can get through as many as possible. I'm going to start with a question from Nick Lewis. Uh, I, I must admit, I haven't come across this study, but it looks fascinating. Have panel members any views on Chris Hope's um, working paper? This is from Cambridge University Judge Business School that's just out. His proposal is that healthy people should be offered the opportunity to be immediately infected and quarantined until no longer infectious, and then given the option to rejoin normal life. Do you think that should be an option? Um, the, um, uh, an anonymous attendee says, do the panelists have, have great hope for the new French theory of nicotine res resilience? Uh, I think there's been some suggestion actually this might be a situation in which, um, uh, it, it, in which actually if you are a nicotine user, you potentially are less at risk. It might hurt your health in, in uh, many other ways. Um, and then the next question I got is, do you believe that the economies around the world, this is an anonymous question as well, and especially the ones with more vulnerable economies could benefit from the Malthusian theory possibly in the long run? So those are my, those are the three questions. Uh, pick and choose, but please be succinct. I'll do it in reverse order now. So Juan, if I can stay with you, then I'll go to Jakob and then Martin. Juan, your thoughts on those? Um, okay, so the first one would also depend on whether immunity is uh, real or not. Uh, otherwise, mm -hmm. uh, it would be pointless, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, well, the, the, 
the rights uh, in, in the case of Spaniards would be to, to be tested, which has not been done still after a month and a half of nightmare. So I wouldn't know about that. Uh, regarding the, so what was the second question, Mark? That was, uh, apparently there's a, uh, the, the assertion in the question is that there is some theory in France that, uh, that nicotine may actually be a benefit in mitigating or preventing infection or death. Um, and I think the data on this is extremely uncertain at the moment. But uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, not really. I'm sorry about that. Uh, I would jump to the third question then and the, the Malthusian uh, theory, right? Well, I would merely point out that we've lost in Spain, in March alone, uh, about 8,000 pensioners. So definitely uh, the welfare state, even though the, I mean, the, the, the economic crack in Spain is, will be massive, it will be of uh, epic proportions. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we are getting rid of our generation because of the incompetence of our government. So, if one uh, wants to look at this crisis from that point of view, uh, well, there are some, there is some data, in, uh, you know, pointing to that end. Okay, Jakob, your thoughts very briefly, and then Martin. Uh, yeah, I don't think there would be Malthusian benefits in this case. I mean, you, you could, uh, economic historians say that after the Black Death, there was a very clear case of wages going up for, for the people who survived. But we don't have a land-based economy anymore. So I think they will, this will just be disruptive, especially for, for developing countries. So that's something that we should be very concerned about. And that, that there hasn't been much discussion about either. But... I, I saw the World Food Program has been warning that, that hunger may be going up, etc. Um, and when it comes to voluntary infections, I don't think that's a good idea. I mean, if people want to, that's up to them. But no, I think the suggestion I mean, was it would be voluntary. You could volunteer and say, please inject me and yeah. infect me. And then um, assuming that that leads to immune... Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we don't know that. I mean, yeah. That's a big, big if. Uh, we, we don't know if... We, if you have permanent immunity. So, uh, mm -hmm. well, it, it, if, we, if it can be shown that, that it leads to permanent immunity, then uh, sure. possibly. Martin, your quick thoughts, and then I'm going to move on to three further questions. Yeah, uh, I think uh, the Malthusian question was answered uh, brilliantly by, by Jakob. Um, the, the Nick Lewis um, proposal, um, well, I'm, I'm this actually happens, at least in Denmark, uh, with children. <laughs> so people send their children to other children who have certain diseases. I th it's not measles. I think we have a vaccine against that. But some, some children's chicken diseases. Chickenpox? Chickenpox? Yeah, it could be. Yeah. could be. Um, uh, and so, so that's happening voluntarily. So, so they want their children to have this before they reach a, a certain age because they, it's better for children to have it when they're young. And they send their children to play with other, ch other children to catch the disease. So it's actually part of social norms in Denmark to do that. So I wouldn't, I, I, I wouldn't be, I'm a little bit hesitant for some reason, uh, but that's more of a, a gut thing than, than, than a brain thing. Sure. Uh, and uh, I think it's a very important way of thinking about this. So antigen tests, tests are now being put out into the market and will probably be available in a few weeks. And uh, to give people the uh, empowerment to go and get a test to find out if they have had the disease so that they can government can stop harassing them i think that, that there's there's a lot of potential in that so if you're mm -hmm. immune why should government be harassing you and also you are an asset to society you can go and do work where you uh deal with people without infecting them mm -hmm. okay let me fire a few more questions at you gentlemen uh neil monnery asks uh the science in Spain says lockdowns work. In Sweden, the science says they don't. In Denmark, the science says a bit of both. In Austria, masks work, but the World Health Organization says they don't. Is epidemiology actually a science? Why have politicians tied themselves to policies that are clearly not scientifically based, or at least are uh, heavily uh, contested? Um, Linda Webstern asks, um, uh, so she would be interested to hear comments on how to assess the health costs and benefits of continuing or entering the lockdown, as well as again, as well as the economic costs and benefits. We're sort of seeing it as a 
trade-off, and it's one that I, I think is a bit more multi-dimensional of this, of saving lives if it's damaged to GDP. But, you know, potentially locking everybody in their homes has a pretty big health consequence yeah. uh, negatively um, as well, and things like taking exercise and all of the rest of it. So what are your thoughts on that? We've got uh, an anonymous question that I wanted to come to, which um, uh, is it really the case, uh, this person asks, that Scandinavians are more compliant with rules voluntarily? Or is that just a popular cultural myth? What is actually the evidence? Or is it anecdote and feeling that Danes and Swedes react, you know, uh, voluntarily to authority and rules? Is that really, really culturally true? Uh, and then uh, a fourth question, because I'm trying to cram them in, don't feel that you've got to answer all of them, gentlemen, is from Edgar Bulner. No one's mentioned how they procured sufficient medical devices and protective equipment, which we in the UK clearly did not. Uh, I'd just like to add on to that, whether you think that when we come out of this, again, it sounds a bit inhuman to say so, we're going to have fascinating data sets about how each <laughs> different countries have acted differently and what the apparent consequences were. And uh, do you think there'll be an, you know, might that lead to an interesting discussion about which healthcare systems in different European countries appeared to work and which didn't. Again, let me go round back in, the, Martin, starting with you, then Jakob, then Juan, and then I will try and get um, another round of questions or two, we've got plenty in the box. Martin, your thoughts on those? Okay, so I'll, I'll try a, a couple of them, uh, so it's not to spend too much time on it. Um, I think the way to think about what works is probably uh, we need some kind of mix of different strategies. I'm not saying no lockdown at all. It doesn't make sense to have concerts with thousands of people uh, during an, an epidemic, probably not. Uh, but uh, to have a sort of massive lockdown where you're not allowed to go outside, as, as Jakob pointed out, well, outside, you're not very likely to, 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 to catch the Danes have been able to walk outside uh, all along. And, and, as, as, and we can uh, spend time together in groups of 10. Uh, and in private homes, actually, we are allowed to be more. Uh, but um, the police strongly urged us not to, so we don't. <laughs> um, uh, so, 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 so we probably need some, some, some policy mix, some elements of this and that. I think testing and, and uh, isolating is, is very interesting. I think the idea of what the Swedes are, are saying is, okay, let, let ordinary people go about doing their business, but let's isolate the vulnerable. Um, they haven't been that successful in doing it. Uh, some, there's, there have been a lot of infections in old people homes. Maybe Jakob can talk a little bit about that. Um, uh, so I, I, I don't agree that we don't know anything. We, we actually, we're beginning to know quite a bit. We have some models in Denmark. Norway has come out with some reports about the cost and benefits of different, different proposals. And we need, we need a, a rational approach to looking at costs and benefits of each option that we have to contain the disease. That's what we need to do. Uh, now, the other question was healthcare costs. I, I agree completely with Linda. Um, that's something that we need to be very aware of. In Denmark, we have postponed at least 25,000 uh, uh, operations that aren't you know, uh, acute, but um, there are definitely going to be complications from that. It's turned out to be completely unnecessary. We never had more than 138 people in intensive care and we had a capacity of a thousand so we undershot if that's a word uh, by you know uh, you know almost a factor eight or something like that um, uh, we have a job loss we have 10 real unemployment if we include the people who are being paid by the government not to work right now uh, is is about 10 11 percent now in Denmark that's very high in a few weeks that's the highest it's been for, for 30 years and it's just going to keep rising if we keep the lockdown going that's going to have effects. So we have the same stories that you have in some countries that we've a double of the uh, number of people who uh, who call, uh, you know, women who've been beat up by the husbands who uh, who try who, who who call places uh, for help for that. That's been doubled. There are some signs that people are drinking more. There are signs that that um, that people are getting all kinds of yeah yeah Mark I'm getting so thirsty looking at you. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so, so, um, so, so that's, it's going to be very interesting. Oh, one thing, uh, the prime ministers frightened people so much in Denmark that they've stopped going to the, so, uh, we have fewer new cancer patients now 
So that's worrying because presumably cancer rates have not gone down. So a lot of people are deciding not to go to the doctor with their symptoms. Sure. Uh, and some of those people are going to die. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we'll be looking at this in a few years time and know a lot more about what, what's the right thing to do. And we need, I think we need governments to be a lot more concerned about some of the risks of doing too much uh, mm -hmm. uh, rather than just looking at the risks of doing too little. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, Yakov, your thoughts? Uh, yeah, about the first question about the scientists saying the, all the different things. It's the same discussion in Sweden. So, I mean, there, there are some very vocal epidemiologists who don't agree at all with the, the public health agency and the, the, the state epidemiologist and his assessment of the situation. Um, so, but I, I still think that epidemiology is a science, just like e economics is a science, even though uh, economists disagree about the, the cause of the Great Depression, but uh, mm -hmm. I mean, we, we just don't know. There's a lot of uncertainty out there, but uh, certainly uh, epidemiological models and, and uh, data can, can help us uh, make the decision. And we see that, that more and more information is, is becoming available so we can make more informed decisions, hopefully, over time. Um, and regarding the question about if Scandinavians are more compliant with the, the advice of authorities and in other countries. I, I, I'm not sure. I haven't seen any evidence of that, actually. It's, it's, a, it's a potential explanation, but I, I wouldn't be sure. It's widely it. assumed, but I've never seen it proven, right? Yeah, uh, I, I would say the same. Maybe Martin has something to add. Is that okay, um, Mark? Yeah, sure. Very quickly, Martin, So I want to get one more round of questions in and we're on the clock. I think we are in some ways. Uh, uh, and a lot of, I think we are in, in many ways that, that are signaling ways. Uh, so we, we want to look compliant so we don't cross red, rights, red lights, at least if people are looking. Um, but, mm -hmm. we, um, but we um, do a lot of ta tax avoidance. <laughs> Very commendable cultural norms there in Denmark. Um, okay, well, your thoughts on those questions, and then I am going to squeeze in one final round of questions. So uh, if I can ask the panelists to be brief, one. Hey, um, so very quickly, uh, whether lockdown works, I think uh, it looks like it works uh, for health purposes, at least, uh, not economics, obviously. Uh, whether some countries are more compliant than others, I think they are culturally. Um, I also think that there are some countries that might, you know, have more, I don't know, uh, human contact, more kisses, more hugs, uh, perhaps. Um, but at least in Spain, it looks like, uh, I mean, it's, it's being a bit extreme uh, to, to have extended this situation of, uh, you know, for such a long time. It looks more like our public authorities panicked uh, because they reacted uh, late and wrong. And also, I, I would like to, to just uh, mention a couple of things about uh, medical equipment. Um, for instance, um, when it comes to, to the Spanish authorities dealing with this crisis. So, for instance, after being offered a number of suppliers uh, from China and the EU uh, of quick tests um, um, for COVID-19, uh, we ended up buying them from a Chinese company without a license. Uh, they were only right 30% of the time. Uh, we spent wow. 17 million euros there. Uh, wow. Then we gave these tests back, back and bought some more from the same company. Uh, both times the government tried to hide this fact, the amount of money spent on this, etc. The government also bought some masks uh, and distributed them across Spain. They turned out to be faulty. Once the government was aware of this, they took the masks back eight days later. Uh, so th they did this eight days uh, after they knew they were faulty. And the result was over 100 uh, doctors and nurses uh, being infected for this reason alone. We, we spend on that uh, 31 million euros. So th this gives you an idea of how, how sloppy um, public authorities are and how they are really panicking and reacting to the crisis. As Martin pointed out uh, earlier on, uh, we are merely, well, all of us are trying to, to not become Italy, even though Spain has already surpassed Italy. Uh, and but we don't have a, a real strategy forward okay 
Uh, listen, we've got a little over time, but I'm going to try and squeeze in just uh, a few more questions. One observation I'd make also about the medical procurement issue, you know, are we getting the right amount of protective equipment to each hospital? Uh, are, uh, are health workers, you know, risking their lives because they haven't got it? I think there's a, it hasn't been, that, that's been the topic of um, political uh, controversy in the United Kingdom, you know, did the government not buy the right stuff at the right time? But uh, although I pointed out, I think there's going to be some interesting data sets to compare and contrast different countries and public institutions. There are also going to be some fascinating comparisons between the private sector and the public sector. Uh, if you look at our public sector healthcare system, procurement's been a disaster. Uh, you know, we can't apparently get surgical gloves delivered to a hospital on time. Whereas if you look at private sector supermarkets, they've been an absolute trial. You can go into every supermarket and right, there was a bit of a run on toilet paper for some reason, initially. God only knows why. I mean, I've never seen a zombie apocalypse movie where the people's first <laughs> instinct is to rush down by toilet paper. But the, super, the private sector supermarkets are providing us with wine, beer, peanuts, you name it. You can get it in the private sector. It's actually fantastic. Let me bring in just a few more questions. I appreciate some people will have to leave because we have gone over time, but I've got some questions. And I'd like to just try and get a few more in. Um, uh, one of them is about the blame game, really. Uh, there's been much, uh, has there been much discussion or criticism in your respective countries about China's role in the early parts of this epidemic? Or are people scared to point a finger at China for fear of being labelled racist or for business reasons? And I'd add on to that, and you can check it out on the IA uh, uh, YouTube channel. Uh, if, uh, has there been any criticisms of the World Health Organization, for example? Is there starting to become some finger pointing? or is this being treated as an act of God? More optimistically, uh, Andy Mayer asked, which countries in the EU do you think are best place to innovate solutions uh, to this uh, uh, particular problem? Where, where do you think the answers are gonna come from? Uh, moving back to the blame game, um, uh, an anonymous uh, person asks, um, the EU presidents apologized for the EU's handling of coronavirus and the lack of European solidarity. Do you think that will affect support for the EU in your country? or boost or potentially boost support for the Danish People Party, the Swedish Democrats or Vox in Spain. Uh, Miko Avero um, asks, an idea has been floated that we should consider citizens' assemblies to gain wider approval for the direction of travel when countries begin to come out of isolation. What are your thoughts on governments using non-parliamentary institutions uh, to make uh, decisions? My own view is the non-parliamentary institutions they should use are the epicenter think tanks. I'd be very much for uh, uh, that being the basis on which decisions are made. And then uh, lastly, Eric Fillmore asks, if general good health helps as a present, uh, as preventative medicine, i.e. if you're generally in, in good health and fit and healthy, you're less likely to uh, suffer from uh, uh, coronavirus. I'm not sure if you're less likely to get it, but you're more likely to uh, brush it off. Uh, should general good health be a central uh, priority in the future? We are not looking at uh, China or or the World uh, Health Organization. Actually, we, we still think uh, it does uh, well, anything, really. Uh, we are pointing fingers, though, to our government, as I pointed out several times, and to the EU, as we want others to, to pay for our mistakes and our, um, yeah, our wrongdoings. So business as usual. And I do think this, this pandemic, you know, points out to, to the, really to the, to the important stuff, right? Um, when it comes to, to police, uh, the military, uh, doctors, nurses, etc. And I do expect uh, our um, future, you know, state budgets to, to reflect that when it comes to public spending. Okay, uh, Jakob your thoughts on any of those points I've just raised? Yeah, in Sweden there hasn't been that much finger pointing, I would say. There's been a few articles about the role of China and the cover-ups and the WHO's uh, odd position with regards to, to the Taiwan issue, but mostly it's been focusing on the, the Swedish situation and the ways forward rather than, than trying to, to blame someone. Um, and I think the EU issue is, is very worrying that we're, we're seeing that, I mean, just a, a symbol is that usually when, when 
politicians in Sweden give press conferences, they have an EU flag and the Swedish flag in the background, but now silently the EU flag is gone and it's just a Swedish flag in the background. Um, and uh, that's one of the things that I'm very worried about, that the EU has had such an ineffective response. And I think uh, not many people are, are listening to what they're saying anymore. So, uh, but I mean, the EU has weathered crises before, so I, I think the EU might come out stronger uh, at the other side, but it, it, will, it will take political will to, to achieve that. Martin, your final closing thoughts. Well, I'm not, I'm not sure what the, the European Union should have done about this. I, I think this may, it may be better to have, I mean, it, I think it's good that Sweden has one strategy and Denmark another. I'm, I'm not sure it's so good the Spanish strategy is. No strategy. <laughs> but, 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 um, but the different, Germany has an interesting uh, test uh, strategy. And, and uh, this, is, this has always been the strength of Europe, that, that we get knowledge from, from uh, and, and we get institutional competition and uh, improvement through different countries doing things in different ways. So I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that it, I, I, I mind the EU not really having a role in this. I, I don't really see what the federal uh, mm -hmm. issue is uh, about this, but maybe I'm, 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 I'm overlooking something. Uh, pr the procurement thing, let me just say um, that there was a debate in Denmark, the South Korean company, uh, or maybe it was the government, uh, offered us a lot of test kits, uh, kits at one point and we turned them down, um, which turned out to be unfortunate. Um, and I think that's an example of something that we know about from public choice theory, that public authorities tend to start out by uh, uh, underrating or underreacting. And then at some point, the, there's a scandal because of that. And then they, they overreact after that. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what we've seen. I mean, we had public officials a few weeks before the lockdown saying that this, this uh, virus would uh, probably never get to Denmark. And then the same people a few weeks later were, were hailed as a lot of people saying, oh, we're so happy that they are in control and we feel so secure in their hands and all that. But, but a couple of weeks ago, they were completely wrong about what was going to happen uh, a few weeks uh, later. So, mm -hmm. so th there, there are some interesting psychological uh, issues here. Thanks again for watching this video. For more information on the history of pandemics, the economic and regulatory impact of coronavirus and much, much more besides, please do subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can hit subscribe just down here on YouTube if you're watching on the YouTube platform. Also make sure that you hit the notification bell. That will mean that you get updates as soon as we post more material. You can also follow our podcasts at ieapodcast.podbean.com. And please also visit our website, iea.org.uk, where you can sign up for our e-newsletter, IEA Daily. Thanks again for joining us.